Welcome, Mark Nepo. It's great to see you again. Oh, it's great to be with you again. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So I wanted to talk to you about your new book, The Half-Life of Angels. Uh, and I also wanted to connect it to what we're doing in the Seekers Forum this month, which is looking at confidence and resilience. Mm. That feels really central to the themes that you cover in this book. So I'd like to uh, just give you a line from some of the poems that I love the most and thought we could just riff off of that and have some conversation. Uh, that sounds wonderful. Great. Thank you. So the first one that intrigued me is when you write, often what matters doesn't reach us until the crisis is over. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that, that uh, and so let me back up a second, because one of the rhythms of life, uh, certainly opening and closing, but the, the, that also translates, uh, I think, to expanding and being constricted. And 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 in situ, you know, spiritually, I think the way the body does that biologically. Well, spiritually, our, our ex experience of difficulty and circumstances, often things contract, and then they expand. And of course, the challenge is, you know, how do you believe in the expanse when everything contracts? And so, you know, I have found in my own life over time that. Um, this is actually one of the definitions for me of functional faith that when when life constricts the, the vastness hasn't changed i it's real the constriction i'm going through but it won't stay that way and so often i need to uh, hold on because i may not be grateful in the moment of constriction but i will be grateful once it let's go and then i can see what the lesson might be what the growth might be and so yeah you know to say that in it oh i'm grateful for this pain no 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 one's grateful for that but this too speaks to uh resilience and and, and confidence you know um uh and i think you know there's a great metaphor that's in the upanishads that i love it's a they somewhere in there there's an image uh equates spiritual growth to how a caterpillar it moves forward and then before it can move again it bunches up which mm -hmm. actually moves it back and then it inches forward so there's always this kind of two steps forward one step back but we're still moving forward right and i think it's the same thing with this constriction and expansion right and functional faith uh, happens in that moment when we can't see the way forward. Yeah. Yeah. And so this this, this brings up, you know, I love uh, Vaclav Havel, the wonderful, you know, the first uh, president of the Czech Republic once communist rule fell. And he was a poet and a playwright, so a rare poet president. But his definition of hope uh, is really helpful. And um, he said that hope is not the optimism that things will turn out well, but the belief that things will, regardless of how they turn out, will have meaning. Exactly. And that's so, I mean, that's so profound. Uh, let, let, let's move into the second uh, second quote that I love. You say, we cling to everything, clothes, memories, dreams, when only burning them will warm us. <laughs> talk about, talk about that. Well, I think that, you know, it's very, being spirits in bodies and time on earth, of course, are in our humanness, we cling and, to things and we think that they will protect us. And we even cling to self-interest and we cling to uh, whatever it might be. And the truth is, as D.H. Lawrence asked the question, what is the best self-protection being who you are or hiding who you are? Mm -hmm. And so certainly there are times when we need to protect ourselves, cover ourselves or have some kind of external protection. But more deeply, most of the time, at least I've discovered, it's being who we are and that means taking all the coverings off 
Um, and so, yes, we uh, at a deeper level, we need to burn away everything that's false. And I think that the life of transformation, whatever triggers it, which, which can be wonderful things as well as difficult, I think the life of transformation somehow paradoxically everything is burned off except that that won't burn everything that's breakable will fall away so that all that's left is what's unbreakable mm -hmm. and so you know it reminds me there's this wonderful maybe you might be aware of it but this samurai warrior masahide who in the 1600s after a life of being a, a successful warrior he put down his sword and went to apprentice with Basho. Mm. And man, I would have loved to talk to that guy. Like, what happened? <laughs> you know, right? Tell me about this. But his, as he started to write haiku, his, you know, famous haiku is this, that my barn having burned to the ground, I can see the moon more completely. Doesn't minimize, again, as we're talking about that constriction, it doesn't minimize the loss of the barn or going through that fire. And once that has been leveled, oh my God, I had no idea this vastness was there to hold me. Mm -hmm. So how can we not cling quite as, uh, you know, quite as destructively? to the things of our lives, knowing that obviously we don't push them all away voluntarily at once. Yeah. But what is the art for you? Now you're in your, you're a man in your seventies. You've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> what is the art of holding lightly to what we love? Well, I, th I think, and, and th this speaks to this particular thing, but to my overall understanding about spiritual practice, in general and that it, it is a practice of return mm -hmm. that is being human i commit myself to these things in this case not clinging mm -hmm. and being human i will <laughs> mm -hmm. you know even after all i've learned and all i've been through you know we can get off of this i'll trip bringing the garbage to the curb get tight and cling and then i've got to learn it all over again or at least remember oh oh and return. So I think it's not about eliminating our humanness, but to continue to continually spiral through our humanness and get ever closer. So, you know, the buttons that are pushed in our psychological upbringing, I'm 72. Are they gone? Absolutely not. Do they, you know, but when I was younger, a mood of insecurity might cloud me for a month without I'm not realizing what it is mm -hmm. but now it's more like a sneeze mm -hmm. oh, oh I rec I rec yeah I can't eliminate it but oh I recognize this mm -hmm. yep okay I don't like it and even 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 at this stage right being human there are times we get stuck so then I gotta call you up and say as my friend you know that how I used to do that I'm stuck <laughs> help <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Let's move to the next one. The great battle is to dive through desperation into our gift. I love yeah. the juxtaposition of desperation and gift. Can you say something about that process? Yeah. Well, I think that, and, and as you know so well, Mark, and you've written about too, is, you know, what Jung has terrifically pointed to as our shadow that you know so many of the things that are our gifts if we are unaware in moments or out of balance uh they become uh liabilities they become draining darknesses on us and and we become desperate looking for what's already there mm -hmm. and you know often uh one of the greatest quiet courage is i think we can try to inhabit is through accepting the truth of what is discovering that even even in pain or fear everything is enough as it is mm -hmm. everything is, you know we are complete you know there's beautiful paradox where Pla plato said we are born whole 
but we need each other to be complete. And I think that, you know, this, this sense of, and, and another good example is in Dante's Divine Comedy, you know, that sprawling, magnificent epic, which we're all asked to read too young. Uh, okay. And, um, but I, what I love in there is that there are these dozens of these little lessons without explanation that appear on the way. Just these little brief things that you go, wait, wait a minute. And one of them is in hell, as Virgil is his apparition guide, his spirit guide, he's walking along in hell and they see two lovers over here, Francesco and Paolo. And the line is, they're in hell and they're spinning in endless identification with each other. Endless identification, codependence, long before there was a word for codependence. So now we go hundreds of pages later. Now we're in paradise. Hey, there's the same lovers, Francesco and Paolo. Right. And now the line is they're still, they're orbiting each other, but each has a center. And so without explanation, the, you know, the desperation is without a center. We spin an endless identification with each other. Hmm. But the question is not, the, the quest is not to separate from each other. But to have a center, and this often the difference between hell and paradise is a center. Mm. And then we're in our gift. Then we're not becoming each other. We're supporting each other and loving each other and seeing each other. And we all know, you know, in, especially in long term relationships, man, we can, you know, we can trip from one to the other over breakfast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I so love- this desperation is is um, when we forget, when we have this spiritual amnesia mm. that circumstance sometimes throws us into, and we forget our worth, and we forget who we are, and we forget what matters, then we get desperate. Mm-hmm. And desperate for what is already there. Right. And then we have to remember, then we have to help each other ground and that's the sinking through the desperation into our gift Mm -hmm. and that's the disidentification you're talking about that's yes stopping mistaking ourselves for our circumstances or mistaking ourselves for uh the other yeah yeah or looking for the other for the worth that only we can accept and and so this is the paradox and the beauty about relationship of course because you know no, no one can can affirm my worth as a human being but me in my direct relationship with spirit and oneness and life. And I want belonging and I want relationship. I do want to be seen and heard and want to see and hear you. Um, but that's where we cross wires. So I fall, you know, if you on the one hand, in a positive way, if you see, and this is often happens with first love, right? You see me, you love me. For the first time, you are showing me a part of me that I didn't know was there. And now I mistakenly think without a center, oh man, you got the switch to my light. I I can't let you out of my sight, you know, which is actually not loving, but self-serving. But, uh, and of course, the greatest respect we can give to those who love us is to own that light Mm -hmm. and light it ourselves and and the desperation part is say you know we're good friends and i respect you and love you and and you say something that that hurts Mm -hmm. and now i go oh gee especially because i respect you oh god now i'm reaching to you you didn't you know trying to reframe it you didn't mean it can is there a way i can qualify this so there's a hurt there that has to be dealt with, but going horizontally between us, no, only going d- into the depth of my own being mm-hmm. can I reaffirm the truth of my own worth. Mm-hmm. And that's the paradox of intimacy, isn't it? There's no intimacy without space. Yes. Like yes. Wilke says, until I can see you whole against the open sky, I'm not seeing you. Otherwise, that's it's, beautiful. It's, it's merging. Yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's move into your next 
great line. We are born to witness, but taught to watch, and the watcher judges while the witness accepts. Can you talk about the difference between watching and judging? Yes. You know, and this was triggered, this insight by a dear friend of mine, who's a skip, who's in our men's group, which has been meeting for over 15 years. And in his own journey, he was sharing at one time with us in, uh, recently, well, in the last year or so, where he said, you know, I, I, real, I realized suddenly that I am my own witness. I am my own witness below the stories, below the narratives, below what other people think. And as I reflected on that, it led me into this, this insight about, yeah, there, there, and I have a chapter in, a new, in another, a new book called No One is Watching. Hmm. No one is watching. And, you know, I think of Borges's poem, The Watcher. Hmm. He has that wonderful poem where he's just plagued. He said, I can't get rid of this watcher this and he doesn't use it but the inner critic mm -hmm. and and so there are these two things that we struggle with one is the you know from an early age as a part of social control i i don't even know if it's intended but it's cultural we're taught behave someone's watching mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that gets imprinted implanted and now with everything there's a watcher and of course, when you watch, you're not present. So the watcher judges. The watcher says, eh, you're out of bounds. Mm. Eh, watcher, you know, be careful. Mm. Um, and the witness, the witness is devoted to the truth of what is as the great teacher. And therefore, the witness accepts, the witness accepts, and it's the acceptance, the path, the initiation into the path of acceptance that helps us grow. Mm. The, the struggle with the watcher, um, you know, really cripples us. And, and so I've been working with this in some of my groups, and a question I offer to anyone who's, who's listening, a journal question is, so what who's is the who is the loudest voice in your mind that's not your own who is the loudest voice in your mind that's not your own mm. can you explore that a lot of people would say god or their idea of god and which really goes to the difference between religion and spirituality to me between a, a dualistic way of looking at the world and a non-dual way the witness mm -hmm. is the non-dual presence that's self-aware and self-reflecting. Uh, yeah. The dualistic way of looking is there's this God Almighty, there's this authority figure who is scrutinizing you at all times. And so we're taught to keep ourselves in line based on that idea of being watched. Yeah, and I think in that duality uh, model, which is so, I think is so prevalent, um, the same way we look at, you know, atoms and molecules and tissue and organs. So God is is the largest form and we and then, you know, then it's a father or it's a, a community or it's a conscience that's outside of yourself that's always judging or a partner, you know. And so there's many iterations of that that we uh, need to really shake off by being a, a witness as opposed to a watcher and and leaning into our own journey of acceptance rather than repeating the avoidance of judgment say that again we lean into our own version our, own, our own initiation into the practice of acceptance right rather than repeating our uh want to avoid judgment gotcha gotcha yeah so how do you think that shifts uh, a relationship when you move from the wit from the watcher to the witness in an in an intimate relationship well i think we start to um i know in my own experience i think that that it, it has allowed me to uh be more accepting 
and experience more of the humanness of the people in my life, mm -hmm. which is not, this is not to say that we're not responsible to each other. You know, there's this, you know, there's the people who don't want to feel want to say, well, if you go that way, it's not discerning. Well, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It's just as discerning, but it opens up the field to say, now I have to work with all of these parts of these people that I love and that I'm learning from. And, uh, you know, I think it was Aquinas who said, Thomas Aquinas, this wonderful, you know, he said that the fairest branch on the tree of reason is discernment, mm -hmm. but the fairest fruit from the tree is reverence, mm -hmm. not judgment, not criticism, not feedback reverence that when we discern the reward is reverence mm -hmm. oh my god you know and isn't this at the heart of all poetry if we look closely enough at anything in particular it reveals the wonder of everything mm -hmm. and we go oh my god i had no idea and the watcher misses that because the watcher is so, well, the watcher is often so busy comparing contrasting weighing measuring and judging yeah yes yes you can't have awe through the judging mind no i that's wonderfully said yes i agree completely right okay great next poem each time we suffer or love we are dipped like a ladle into the waters that outlive us tell me about the waters that outlive us what do you mean each time we suffer or love we are dipped like a ladle into the waters that outlive us so this bears a story and this touches on resilience and how my uh, experience of my father dying really opened me to a different notion of resilience that I'm still exploring and learning. Hmm. And it's, it's, and I'll share the, the story, but it's, it's the, it's how by being authentically myself and feeling all that is mine to feel complete thoroughly i am then rewarded by touching into the stream of all feeling so by loving completely one person in one instant i trip into everyone who ever loved and the mystery of that that common feeling I'm starting to understand is resilience that I am by being completely myself, I am getting acts like a fish that finds the current, the currents carrying it as well as its own power. And that emo, emotional and spiritual thoroughness is how we as individual fish catch the current. That's all of eternity. So the story is that, you know, when my father toward the end of his life and he was in, in the hospital and he had a stroke and um, and I had some time with him alone and which I loved. And um, and then I found myself like many people there. I was feeding my father applesauce, you know, and it was everything. It was beautiful, heartbreaking, bittersweet. It was you know, TVs blaring down the hall and trays dropping. And here I am in the middle of all this and this open to this sudden moment. And, you know, and I just felt my heart say, you know what? I'm, I'm giving everything to this sudden dance between the spoon and me and his mouth. Mm. And I'm just, all of life was suddenly in this rhythm. I, I didn't want to interrupt his breathing. I didn't want it to hit his spoon to hit his teeth. I want, you know, and I'm crying, of course, and and he's reaching for the applesauce. And Mark, you know, to my surprise in that amazing moment, I tripped into a moment of complete wonder, mm -hmm. complete wonder. Mm -hmm. And there I am. And then all of a sudden I was in the moment of everyone who ever fed a dying parent. Mm -hmm. And I came out of that feeling I was thoroughly, I gave myself completely holding nothing back. And the reward was that I was, all, I was completely there. Mm -hmm. 
And suddenly I was feeling the lift mysteriously of other spirits. And so I was dipped in the ladle of all feeling and all time. And I've started to, to keep working with this and exploring this, this notion that in many ways, the thoroughness of our humanity gives us access to spirit. Mm -hmm. And we can, we have the gift, we can conceptualize, but that's not the same as inhabiting and we inhabit by, um, yeah, be, be feeling, you know, when I lean into your pain, I can fall into the pain of everyone who ever listened to a friend, mm -hmm. you know, and also on the, on the, the wonderful side, if I, am, if I am with you, when we trip into a moment of awe, we are in that numinous field river from all time. Mm -hmm. And that's the real reward of poetry. And again, poetry for me is not the arrangement of words on a page, but the unexpected utterance of the soul. Mm -hmm. the, the words are just a trail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how the that's how the personal bridges to the universal reveals Absolutely. itself to be none other than the universal. Absolutely. It's only through I, I really because of this, I've come to believe that the only time things are abstract is if we don't personalize them then they remain abstract. Right. But if we personalize it, and this is where Blake, you know, could say, uh, you can see eternity in a grain of sand. Well, if we're present enough, if we're open enough, mm -hmm. um, and that's that process of return, you know, I, I'm committed to being wholehearted, but being human, uh, there's times I'm half-hearted. Mm -hmm. So how do I recognize that, witness that, not watch it and judge it, so that I can course correct and go, oh, oh, that's what's going on. I'm half-hearted. Get, get back to wholehearted. Right. What's the difference between that personalizing that you're talking about and straining everything through the ego? And what's the difference between self, uh, self being self-referential? Well, because the difference for me, the difference for me is, thank you, it's a wonderful question. The difference for me is that when we're straining everything through the ego, we're turning everything into us. When we're witnessing, we're seeing where we are a part of everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the difference. Yeah. That makes sense. Wonderful. Uh, next poem. Each life is a koan to be lived with. Can you talk about how a life is a koan in, and, and also the sense that a koan is unanswerable. So is a life unanswerable ultimately on un, not to be understood? Yes, I think, you know, so a couple of things come to mind. And, what, you know, one is um, that, you know, the wonderful quote you probably know from Emerson, of course, about how every situation a person, I'm roughly paraphrasing, but every situation a person encounters is a hieroglyphic waiting to be decoded by our living it. That, that's the experience. And, and what I've taken from that is everyone has a language of wisdom and we learn it a letter and word at a time. Each experience, we decode a letter or a word in our own language of wisdom. And and it's not to arrive anywhere that it is lit, just as Rilke talked about famously about living the questions. It's you know and so this brings up Martin Buber's wonderful expression where he said the world is incomprehensible but it is embraceable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we are asked to stay in endless embrace and letting and and so the, let's couple this or or couple or bring this in uh, that. You know, I love that in the Hindu sense, the word upaguru means the teacher that is next to you at this moment. So everything is a teacher and everything is helps us live into that koan, that riddle that is our life. 
and it's embraceable like another human being is embraceable without ever being comprehensible, right? Uh, so yeah. in the same kind of way, a relationship is a koan that reveals itself letter by letter. It, it creates its own language of intimacy, its own language of spirit, but, but you can never reduce it to, no. a, to a, a, a sort of simple takeaway. Well, and I think this speaks to historically the difference between Eastern traditions and indigenous traditions and the Western tradition, because traditionally the Western tradition has focused that, it, that wisdom is the understanding of truth. And the indigenous and Eastern traditions have, I, in my mind, have pretty much said wisdom is the experience of truth. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, you know, the thing by all the things we're talking about, by being thorough, by living into it, by uncovering through all that we're, that we go through the language of our own wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of what they say in the 12 step programs, which is that understanding is the booby prize. <laughs> you can understand your addiction, for example, from your children. It doesn't change anything. You have to experience it. And yeah. the experience starts with personalizing it, everything you're saying. That's why they start with saying, I am a, you know, I'm a shopper, or I'm an overeater, whatever it happens to be. It's the way of ex actually experiencing and getting it out of the head. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, this, this, um, whole sense of really living into uh whatever we're given yeah. working with what we're given more than working for what we want right which takes us right to our next poem the next line i'd love you to comment on leave a cup out in the rain and you will know the fate of an open mind <laughs> so talk to me about open-mindedness uh and how that um you know how that isn't antithetical to discernment you know yeah that... so open mind which we are sorely in need of today yes open-mindedness and and you speak to this in your wonderful new book too and um so the the image if you put a cup out in the rain it, it, the rain will overflow it mm -hmm. and and that's the reward of an open mind um and so the goal i think of an open mind a working mind is to reach outside itself to reach beyond what it knows mm. when we have we're in that desperation and not the gift when we're in that duality and we're watching and we're not in the witness when we're you know all these things we've been talking about in those moments and this is very prevalent today and it's such a problem then out of fear we look for what will confirm what we already know that's not education that's not education is the cup overflowing the education is thank god you're not me tell me what i don't know yeah. you know and so another kind of image or the, the, for the mind for me too one, one is um which is in a poem somewhere in there that the mind we often think of our mind like a bird nest and we spend all this time putting all the twigs together but the real journey of the mind is it's the bird that leaves the nest and comes back mm -hmm. it's not just always hanging out in the nest right and and we you know so in another way you know i think it was um william james who said you know a lot of people believe they're thinking when they're just rearranging their prejudices <laughs> you know that's true i love you that know. so the other image for me is that the mind is an inlet not a container mm. Mm. it's an inlet not a container and so the, the reward is that it is an amazing conduit it's an amazing bridger between the inner world and the outer world and through that exchange we come alive it is not as so many people would say everything originates in the brain 
everything it's self-contained we're you know i no, that's not my experience at all yeah right it's not a closed system no no that's how and we get into trouble when it's a closed system right and when we imagine it is and i think but that's where a lot of us get our security is by believing that this is our little world and we're going to protect it and we're going to stuff in as much as we can into this little world and that's going to somehow give us security it's going to give us an identity and something to hold on to and of course that is the opposite of awakening absolutely absolutely and i think this you know this brings up uh in one of my books i ran across uh, this definition of egoism uh and and, it, and whether it's you know ethnocentrism or however it's applied person and it came from uh robert keegan who's a developmental psychologist at harvard and um and he fascinatingly defined egoism as uh, or centrism excuse me not egoism centrism whatever kind of centrism mm -hmm. and he defined it as mistaking what is true what is familiar as true Mistaking what is from just because it's familiar doesn't mean it's true. And when we do that, when we take up residence there, then by definition, whatever is new is false. Right. And then we're screwed. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Exactly. So just a couple of a couple more poems. The next one I love. This is not about putting on a happy face or reframing what is difficult. This is about whether we fight the fall uh, into life or dive. So talk to me about not putting on a happy face and not reframing, because that's something that is so much yeah. a part of our conditioning now, even in the self, you know, self in the um, the self-development world, reframe, well, reframe, reframe. Yeah, we we've been uh, one of the kind of offshoots of our modern experiment has been to uh, make a cartoon of, uh, you know, the, the, the wonderful inalienable rights of life, liberty and, the you know, the pursuit of happiness. Well, you know, we've now 200 years or more later, almost 300 years, whatever it is, um, where, you know, we've we've settled on an entitlement to happiness an entitlement to um, stress-free, challenge-free, and, and therefore, you know, and, and you couple that with our suppression of feeling, our fear of feeling. Mm -hmm. And so now there's only, the, the only things that are acceptable to the judge, to the watcher, are the sanitized feelings. And if that's all that's left, then we're the walking dead. Mm -hmm. Because that you know we we are strong enough and deep enough and open enough as human beings with spirits carrying spirits uh that we don't have to fear the full spectrum of feeling in fact they are the teachers mm -hmm. they are the teachers that lead us to oneness to to spirit so you know i'm not um so if you imagine all the, the metaphors you know, at sea, the waves are all on the top, thousands of waves. And of course, you can't, when you look through the water, you can't tell where one wave stops and the deep begins. It's all one water. Mm -hmm. And so I've come to see that those top six or eight inches or even a foot, which are always disturbed by weather, that's our psychology. That's the part that meets the world. It's always disturbed. It's always moving. It's always, and, and every one of those waves is one of the human moods. Mm. Feel, and happiness is one of them. I like happiness. It's like ice cream. Yeah, I like to be happy. Mm. But that's not the same thing as joy. Mm. And to me, you know, I think I was miseducated as a young person to think that, that peace and joy were the, uh, the still point when trouble stopped right right well trouble never stops <laughs> so, <it> is, <laughs> so the image for me is now is that joy is the ocean of being that holds all the waves the thousand moods and that so when when we go in the deep it it 
takes the edge off the agitation of being in the world. It doesn't eliminate it, of course, mm. but that's the value of being the stillness of the deep right sizes all the disturbances we encounter. And so, so our feelings are so important to, um, to allowing us to be th thoroughly here. Right. And so I take it you're not a big fan of trigger warnings and having people <laughs> on campuses not and not be able to say things that are going to upset students. No, absolutely. You know, I had I had a friend who's a marvelous therapist and he trains therapists and and he was just telling me that they, that one of the part of the training is they will role play difficult situations, you know, and uh, that come up. And then someone, you know, said, well, I'm uncomfortable by labeling these people as difficult. <laughs> well, you know, my God, no, things are difficult. Right. And, right. and we actually get strength from calling things as they are, not from shielding us from the many beautiful complexities of being human. Mm -hmm. But in a in a in a polarized world, you know, we we avoid the depths and the contradictions of feeling. Uh, well, and I think I think one of the things trying to simplify in a sort of black and white way and stay safe and protect ourselves from the other, uh, it's impossible to open up to the totality of experience until we're broken open. You know, the great. Great love and great suffering has always broken our bubble. Mm -hmm. And and in some ways, while we are suffering in our society, in some ways, we're not suffering enough. You know, like when when you fall down, I reach for you. You know, that that doesn't matter what you think, what you believe. Mm -hmm. And and this goes back, you know, in the in Chinese Mencius, the the a uh, great, wonderful philosopher, heart-centered philosopher uh, in the Confucian tradition. And, and he talked about human kindness and, and described it as he said, if you saw a child sitting on the edge of a well and you thought that child was going to fall, the thing in you that would drop everything and try to save that child, that's, you, that's kindness. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with your philosophies, your political stance. And so, you know, when that broaches us, when we see that and we act on it, it breaks the, 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 what we think are requirements for getting involved or mm -hmm. caring for others. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So just two more. I'd love to ask you about this line. It is a deeper form of gravity that only the things that find each other come alive. Talk to me yeah. about a deeper form of gravity and what you mean by that. It is a deeper form of gravity that only the things that find each other come alive. Well, this is the, just what we were talking about, that, there, that in the same way that gravity works, spirit works, to me, it's, it's an emanation of life force. It's unnameable, but let's call it life force that draws us together, that does make us go to save that child, that does, when you cry, makes me go to say, what, are you okay? That makes me pick up what you drop, that makes me ask a question. So that, you know, and, and in the Jewish tradition, and all the traditions speak about it, but, you know, in the Jewish tradition in Eastern Europe, there's a term Shekinah, Yiddish term, it means God is in exile. And, and what it really means is God is dormant till you're in relationship. Mm -hmm. And then rabbis would run around ringing bells at dawn in Eastern European, like, like spiritual roosters going, Shekinah, get up, get in relationship, make God visible, come on. So there's, so it's to me an inner uh, force of nature that's equivalent to gravity in that it sparks. A, and this really is what the half-life of angels, which was an intuitive title. But it, to me, you know, when we see that that famous painting of Michelangelo, God and Adam, that little arc, that little space, that that arc, 
that synapse of becoming that draws us to each other is the deeper form of gravity. And that's the half-life of angels intuitively to me, that, that arc that, that bridges that synapse between us. And great love and great suffering always author that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the Zoroastrians believed that love and gravity were the same force. Oh, that's wonderful. I didn't and know that. that. Actually, the cosmos, the planets were, the solar <laughs> system was held together by love. That's so, beautiful. I didn't know that, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, that's I wonderful. Think it's beautiful. And just one last line, Mark. You write that it doesn't matter how we arrive, just that we do. Can you talk about transcending the how and not getting so attached or judgmental uh, around the the methods and the mistakes and the back and keeping our our eye on the on the prize? Yeah, so and so let, let's and when I say arrive in that sense, I'm not talking about arriving at a destination. I'm yes. I'm I'm talking about arriving as in uh, that that naked on uh, the place that all everything's burned off where we're in the beauty and the of, of the isness of being here in this this amazing life and so i think you know this that it doesn't matter how that there are a thousand ways to fall and a thousand ways to get up and all of them work and so this judgment again getting rid of the watcher it's the witness who says yeah they they all work anyone will work, you know, reach, do, be, love, it's all fine. And I think this is what, you know, when we, I I wrote a chapter in the last book about Leonard Cohen's Broken Hallelujah Mm -hmm. and that amazing song of his. And I think what he was getting at there was what we're talking about. And And he says, you know, one of the famous lines is, it's not someone who's seen the light, it's a cold and broken hallelujah. It's like whether you're lighted and you do all the right things or you fall down and break, it doesn't matter. You'll get there. And that's what matters. That language that Emerson was talking about of our life that's decoded and and brought alive within within each of us. So it's this this sense that that and that also speaks to our very first line about the constriction and expansion that um, the, the mystery, what the hallelujah is about, I think, in Leonard Cohen is, you know, it means literally praise God, but that's not what he's talking about. He, he, you know, he's talking about, to me, the sense that, you know, if you and I are, are on a raft at sea and, and, the, and the sea smashes our raft, well, that's tragic for us. That's hard. That's painful. And it doesn't diminish the majesty of the sea. And the broken hallelujah is the watcher, the witness says, hallelujah. <laughs> right, right, right. Regardless of what, whatever immediate impact it might have on our little life. Yeah, and, and that goes back to like, we're not grateful for the raft being smashed, but if we can help each other get through it, we'll, we'll yeah, we'll learn from the majesty of the sea. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mark. It's so oh, great so... to talk to you as always. Yeah, thank you. It's a joy, Mark. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. My pleasure. And uh, we are big fans of yours at the Seekers Forum. And now I think you need, your dog needs to go out for a walk. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> See you again. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much. Take good care. Good luck with the book. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye.